Greetings and welcome to Georgian Crossroads. It has been a while, hasn't it? Well, it's been a weird time. And I thought that's what we would go over today. What the last couple of months have been like here in Tbilisi. Uh, for those of you who hear the constant background noise, and I don't just mean the wind. One thing I haven't done for quite a while is tell you what's going on with Georgia. And, and that's been deliberate. I'm still not quite done with my Czech, uh, my Prague diaries. I have a few more of those to do. But life here has been distracting, we'll say that. Uh, not just uh, events so much as it is just sort of a, an atmosphere, which I'm going to talk about today what life has been like in Georgia since February 24th. And I'm not going to cover, you know, every little thing there is. Uh, it would take too long. But I just want to give you a sense of what things have been like. On the evening of February 24th, there was a massive demonstration in front of the Parliament building that was a demonstration protesting the... Russian invasion of Ukraine. And there have been photos and videos of this demonstration. I saw them that night back in, when I was in Prague. And a couple of days later, there were uh, similar demonstrations in Prague. Uh, one, the one I was at had about 80,000 people in it. Uh, according to estimates. I didn't count everybody individually. But I did get some footage of that, which is what you're looking at right now. Now, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that the, the demonstration here in Tbilisi was not simply a protest against the Russians. It was certainly that. But it was also a questioning of what the government was doing whether they were being too lenient on uh, the Russians. And many, many, many people here, the vast majority of people here, do not trust the Russians at all. Uh, we'll say don't trust Putin, because that's really who they don't trust. Because, one thing you have to understand, I'm sitting here in Tbilisi. There was a war in 2008 that was in South Ossetia. The border of South Ossetia is approximately 60 kilometers away, which is what, 40, 45 miles, something like that, off the top of my head, for my American uh, viewers. Um, it's not very far away. And there have been soldiers positioned there the whole time. And here's the thing, the border should be at the top of the mountains. But South Ossetia is on this side, so they're, you know, they haven't got any really anything to stop them from rolling into town here. And in fact, in 2019, there were anti-Russian demonstrations then to which Putin responded by stopping all air traffic from coming in. He did not prevent the Russians from coming and visiting, but that radically crippled the economy, uh, the usual tourist economy by preventing the Russian planes from landing, which prevented uh, most of the normal tourists from coming, because most people don't want to you know, take all the planes it takes to get here from Russia, since you can't come straight here. And it's been like that ever since. Um, but like I said, the, the, the protest was only partially, I mean, very large part, a protest against Russia, in favor of Ukraine. But it was also a protest against the government not taking a hard enough stand. One of the problems the government is facing with, though, is the soldiers, the Russians, on this side of the border. And there are often demonstrations, signs, slogans, uh, letting us know, reminding us of the fact that Russia is essentially inside the borders of Georgia. And if you look on the map, you'll see the old borders, but the new borders are these little dotted lines, and there's a couple of them. 
In 2008, in August, they had a five-day war with the Russians. And this was very much a prelude to the Ukrainian uh, uh, invasion. How so? Uh, how did, well, for one thing, the, the Abkhazians and the South Ossetians had already broken away. There were civil conflicts, civil, uh, a civil war going on in the 1990s, which was a terrible time for Georgia. But in 2008, what happened was South Ossetia had, we'll say, relationships had deteriorated, but Russia was now sending, there is a highway that goes from South Ossetia to North Ossetia. North Ossetia is inside the borders of Russia. And they started funneling troops down here. And so, so here, here you have it. You have a breakaway rep a section of Georgia that then gets Russia's support. Does this sound familiar? It's a playbook that they're willing to use over and over. And it's the exact same playbook that the Latvians, the Estonians, the Lithuanians, the Moldovans, where a similar thing has already happened, uh, are all concerned about. It's Russia's ability to say, yes, but you have Russians in our territory. Or some of your people want our help to prevent. And then they'll exaggerate as they have uh, the, the, the Nazi threat or whatever. Um, and that's what they did, which provoked Saakashvili, who was the president at the time. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but let's just put it to you this way. They provoked him into attacking first, which was a really dumb idea. And But that's what the Russians like to do, because then they can go in saying they're protecting. Whereas it was actually, they built, see what happened was the Ukrainians actually just waited, which is why the whole world looks at Ukraine and essentially says that wasn't fair of the Russians to go in. But the five day war here, and mercifully it was only five days, but it included really bombs and shelling. Putin was just smart enough <laughs> to have this go on while the Olympics were going on. So nobody was really paying attention to it. Um, most people don't know much about Georgia. Anyway, ever since 2008, there's been this kind of unease about the Russians literally in our backyard. And when I moved here... Um, People, uh, you know, I, I realized this could get active at any moment. I contacted one of my friends in Georgia who has, who is part Ukrainian and asked her, well, what's going on? She says she has relatives in Kharkiv and I said, oh no. Uh, uh, she asked if I knew of anyone who might be able to help. I gave her a few addresses, but I don't know if that helped. But, you know, one of her questions to me is, so you, are you going to stay? And I said, well, yeah, of course I'm going to stay. Why, why would I leave? Well, just because there's a sense of threat. Yeah, I, I was in both the Czech Republic, and of course then I came back home to... Uh, came back home to Tbilisi. The interesting thing, is that the flight was totally booked with Russians coming in. I'm going to talk about them in a minute. The, here's the crazy thing. I had a round trip. I was gone for about three weeks to, to Prague. And I had a round trip ticket that was going through Kiev on the way back on March 6th. I saw what was coming in and around the 22nd. I canceled my trip and used Pegasus airlines through back through Istanbul, which was not my preferred mode of, of arrival. Uh, it's just, I don't like uh, the airport in Istanbul very much. It's, it's just crowded and uh, it, it's not a very friendly airport. I, I was in Prague on one end of this, of Ukraine, and here in Tbilisi on the other end of Russia, Ukraine, with that Ukraine between us. And the feeling was the same on both sides. And that is, oh no, not again. And uh, interestingly enough, so many Americans are kind of in this phase of, you know, if you have any sort of empathy for the Ukrainians, it's the media trying to goad us into war. And I'm sitting there going, like, how, how naive can you be? Because here's what they feel 
felt in Prague and what they feel here. That they themselves have been invaded. They feel like this is not just some sort of, they don't look at it as some sort of like uh, NATO hoax to get us involved with Russia, you know. They look at it as rather, you might as well have just uh, invaded us. Because that's how it feels here. And I'm not saying, you know, there are a lot of complications here and there are things you can question. There's propaganda everywhere. And I made another video called Surviving War Propaganda, talking about the propaganda from everywhere. And in Georgia, most of the propaganda is, we're for Ukraine. We stand with, you know, against Russia and Putin. But then it gets really interesting. Now, one of the things that, that you may have been noticing on this video so far is uh, all the Ukrainian flags that are hanging up in Tbilisi. And, I mean, it's literally everywhere you go. Uh, and uh, the, the images I took here from, it was just literally two blocks around my house. I didn't have to go very far to find huge Ukrainian flags, you know, Ukrainian flags blowing in the wind, uh, the Ukrainian colors here and there, like, you know, there's a, there's a, I was walking by just someone's little boutique for clothing and there's like a shirt that's yellow and uh, a pair of shoes that is uh, blue. And that was very definitely a statement <laughs> in a small, strange sort of way. I mean, you look up into the buildings and you see someone's little Ukrainian flag. Uh, and, then, and then sometimes your eyes even deceive you. You start putting together these colors where they don't belong. So I'm looking and then there's you know, a yellow bus and a blue dumpster <laughs> or, or or a trash can that has yellow and blue on the top but it has other colors as well but for a minute you look and you know you just start to see those colors everywhere and sometimes it's your mind playing tricks on you but most of the time not Now I was saying there is a there is a an overwhelming sense of what the Georgians think about uh, what's going on in Ukraine, and part of that has to do with the uh, the having gone through the two thousand eight war, which is still on Georgians' mind all the time. They would really love it for the Russians to go back over the other side of the mountains. But I have one friend I was talking with, and she was standing around a couple of other friends, and they were all kind of like nodding their heads in agreement. She said, Putin wants to invade, but he's not going to do it now. He's going to wait for three or four years. Okay. That would be uh, uncomfortable. I, and meanwhile, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, where would I go if we started getting bombs here? It would look really serious. And I think I've got some friends who live on the other side of the country that probably no one wants to uh, invade over there because it's too close to Turkey. I go like, okay, that's a possibility. You know, you just think about these things because you don't want to wait and think about it at the last minute. There are other people here who, I've, I haven't met a Georgian, there are pro-Russian Georgians here. There are people who kind of wish we could go back to the Soviet Union. Uh, there is a museum in the town of Gori, which is the birthplace of Stalin. And this museum isn't particularly against Stalin. 
It's not like highlighting massacres and purges and gulags or anything. It's all kind of, you know, Stalin. I mean, there's a Stalin museum here that I went into, and the man there was, uh, he was, he was, I, I, I was talking with some Ukrainian people, and he was saying to me, uh, are you, you know, do you speak Russian? I said, no. And then I said, I'm from America, I'm from Alaska. And then he says, are you a communist? And I said, no. <laughs> and I didn't want to tell him how much I'm not a communist. Uh, but, but then he gave us this tour. I'm, show, I'm showing you a couple of images from uh, this, this trip. This was several years ago. But, but it gives you the idea that, I mean, this, this museum I was in a few years ago, Stalin's Printing House Museum, because it was the place where he hid his, uh, a huge printer, because they didn't have, you know, little printer machines back then. Huge printer in the early uh, part of the 20th century where they printed out the communist tracts. And, but it was totally a pro-Soviet museum. There was nothing in there that was in any way critical of Stalin whatsoever. So there are those people here. There are those people who would like to see Georgia part of the Russian Empire again. They are fortunately in a very, very few. But there are, everyone else is kind of on the other side. But some people are just radically against Russia. And, and here's where it all comes down. So I told you I was coming back to Tbilisi on the plane. And there were, I, I was actually talking with some Russians who were coming to Tbilisi. And evidently, I kept hearing different numbers. First, I heard 25,000 Russians had come here fleeing from Russia and also Belarusians. I heard that there were another 5,000, maybe 10,000 Belarusians coming. I've heard numbers as high as 45,000, as low as 25. Recently, a friend said 35. We'll go with 35,000 Russians showed up here. Probably more, but many also drifted on to other countries. Some of them have gone to Istanbul. And in fact, I just met uh, three young Belarusian guys while I went to the practically empty uh, IMAX theater showing, uh, you know, two weeks later, a run of Top Gun Maverick. And, uh, but that was really interesting, talking to them. I'd actually never met any Belarusians before because... Where are you going to meet these people? They're not really allowed outside of their country very much, and you're not really allowed that inside their country very much. So that was kind of fascinating. Very intelligent young men, all computer literate to a high degree, and that's what's happening is that actually the people leaving are, for the most part, it's a brain drain. <laughs> you know, that the people leaving are... The, the smart, bright, young people, people who often make their money, who can make their money uh, through an international corporation or YouTubers. Uh, one of the most famous YouTubers, a guy named uh, uh, Roman, who, <laughs> who uh, has a channel that's spelled N-F-K-R-Z, and he pronounces it as, we'll say... Uh, well, we, if we try to say that, kind of just mumble it, and you'll get the idea of what the channel is actually called. But he's one of, he has like over a million followers or more. I don't know how many, but he's one of the biggest YouTubers. He's here in town now. Hello, Blazers. It is your boy, Roman, your favorite neighborhood Russian. Hi, guys. Who's today? Welcome to a brand new video. And welcome, guys, once again to the center of the beautiful city of Tbilisi, Georgia. That is correct, guys. I don't know if you missed out on my last video, but I have left Russia for an indefinite period of time, and I'm currently, uh, you know, based here. But in today's video, guys, even though we have a lot of very cool stuff to look at, it's not really going to be a walking tour in this video because I actually want to discuss a particular topic that a lot of people are asking me about right now, and that is what it's like to be a Russian abroad right now because this as far as you guys understand, obviously, with the current situation in the world, the anti-Russian or should I say Russophobic tendencies in the world have kind of skyrocketed. And from one point of view, I completely understand it. But from another point of view, of course, it kind of makes me sad and uh, it affects me. I just saw someone yesterday who's coming from Istanbul to here, uh, another YouTuber with a smaller channel, but still, multiple, you know, uh, 
20, 30, 100,000, 200,000, I don't know, some multiples of thousands in their followers. Her name is Dari. She said she was coming here, so she's here by now. And actually, tomorrow I'm going to Georgia. I really wanted to visit this country for a long time. And this option seemed the best because it's not very expensive there. Others have come and gone. Uh, there's uh, some other YouTubers who are a uh, really nice couple. Uh, they're, they're, they're Christians. They, they're living uh, further away from the city in a home because they have relatives coming to visit them. And, uh, but she's near Tbilisi. Uh, at least, you know, the, these people are coming here. Всем привет! I'm glad to see you on my channel today. If you are wondering where we are, we are in the hotel room in the center of Tbilisi. We came here to celebrate our anniversary that was two weeks ago <laughs> and to kind of rest, to explore the city because our friends have been living with us for about a month and it's hard to film at home when there are so many people around. I was walking down the street with a friend the other day and I look in the store and I said, oh, is this like for used clothing or something? And I walk in and I realize it's kind of a place to bring uh, contributions for refugees. Now, here's the thing. How many Ukrainian refugees have come here? I think only a couple of thousand, not that many. Part of it is there's the Black Sea in between us and them and Russia. So traveling from Ukraine to here is not like traveling from Ukraine to Poland, which is next door. And you don't want to go through the Black Sea right now, which becomes important to me in a bit. I'll explain why. So you've got Ukrainians here. You've got all these Russians, Belarusians, and of course, Georgians. Now, there are some, and one of the things I was mentioning, there are some Georgians here who kind of react to the fact that the Russians are here. Most of the Georgians, the, the, the majority, I would say, are pretty cool with the fact that Russians are not Putinites, Putinists, and uh, Putinists. How would you say that? Anyway, uh, and, and they separate Russia from the Russians. And in fact, most of the people who are here are the kind of people who question Putin. And of course, a lot of people can't leave. And, and I, I keep, I follow different Russian YouTubers and uh, more and more of them have to leave because if you say the wrong thing there, you can be thrown in jail now. And that's a real fact. So, you know, they have to go somewhere. And it's a lot like the people who were connected to the white Russians in the First World War as the Russian Revolution was occurring. Except this is much sloppier. People can still leave Russia. Technically, you could actually even go to Russia. I don't know about Americans, but people from, you know, countries that are on the more neutral list. And many Russians have gone to Armenia since they're a lot more Russian-friendly than Georgia is. But, but technically, Georgia is... <laughs> you know, there's a big gulf between Georgia and Russia. But you have to realize the entirety of Russia is sitting above us. And we're a place of, I don't know, three and a half to four million people. Uh, Georgia used to have more people, but a lot of them left during the 90s. American dollars versus the Georgian lari. It had been going up during the COVID times. Uh, and it was, it had gotten up to, you know, I think it crested around close to 350. It was uh, more recently around 340-ish. And then suddenly it was like two, I think the lowest I saw was 282. It's starting to go the other way. And what's strange about that is if you compare the dollar to the Canadian dollar, the dollar to the euro, the dollar to the pound, it's strong. And I'm sitting there going, what's going on here? I, I hate to say it, but I think a lot of it's a bubble. Part of it is these Russians are bringing in more economy. To go with that, however, is you have a problem with Okay, so you've got 30,000 people who say, show up in your city, where are they going to stay? Well, they're going to take all the Airbnbs. They're going to take as much as they can of uh, hotels. But hot uh, certain kinds of hotels tend to be more expensive. But they're also going to look for local apartments. And so all the apartment rates have gone way up. 
Now, when I moved into this place, I made you know videos about moving here. I, I was fortunate. I got a place that was unfurnished because I wanted to furnish it myself. And plus, I'm in the process of building shelves and and doing things. And I'll show you a bit of that in a moment. But the the prices went up from I'm in the place for three hundred dollars. I'm in like the best part of the city. And the reason I got this place is because I looked at the the ad and said, oh, that's living space, not commercial space. And I went and talked them into putting me here. And then I got permission to do what I wanted inside here. And it's around 300 a month. You can't find anything like that these days. It's more like five, 600 a month for something that would have been 300. And sufficiently more the further you get. When I was looking here, the, the apartments were more like 500. Those 500, you know, I wanted 90 square meters worth of space, which is 90 square yards worth of space. So um, I found it. But um, jeepers. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, uh, this guy, uh, Roman, shows us his apartment. Nice apartment, a certain amount of space. But he's spending eight hundred a month on his apartment, which you see, it's it's been going up. Will it go down again when this is all over? Who knows? What's happening with the Georgians who are living here, who are living in these cheap apartments? They have to go further out to places like Ledani or or Didi di or uh, you know, further west, further east, like past Samgori or whatever, Lilo. These places that nobody. It's really hard to commute back and forth to the middle of the city from these areas. And I feel bad because the average Georgians, you know, two things have happened at once. Okay, so my money's gone down in value, but, and the Georgian, not only did, is the Georgian money fairly strong internationally, that doesn't mean anything because the prices for food are going up. So... I think when I first got here, milk was like three lari and fifty tetri. The same milk now is close to five dollars, um, maybe even higher, depending on where you go. Uh, eggs have gone up a bit. Uh, uh, everything you can just feel the whole thing is rising, and so I'm feeling that now, finally, because of this weird the thing happening with the dollar, whatever it is. I think what it is is that the Russians have brought so much new economy, but again, it's a bubble, and it's not going to last. Eventually, the dollar will get stronger again. I know that because I don't think this bubble is going to last that long. And and uh, Georgians should get their dollars now while they can, while they're cheap. Um, so let's see what else. Well, this has kind of thrown a monkey wrench into. My plans to get a container and bring it here. For one thing, container prices have gone up. But the second thing is I suddenly realized what kind of taxes, 18% on the value of my objects would be claimed by customs, which was like someone threw cold water in my face. And uh, they've also changed some other aspects related to customs. So I was getting books sent here from Amazon. But now everything, it seems, is getting customs claimed on it. Where it used to be I had about $100 at a time that I could bring in. It's just odd sorts of rules are changing, such as life. And I just went to the tax revenue office. And I was dealing with this stuff from USA to Georgia, uh, things that I've been getting every now and then. And uh, as I was dealing with that, they said... I mentioned my library and such. And part of the problem is, you know, I've got thousands and thousands of books and records and movies. Uh, I don't want to spend 18% on all of it. For one thing, I didn't spend that much on a lot of the music because I was working in the music business. So my, my music is worth about, I mean, probably less than a dollar a piece. Also, uh, evidently, when you're bringing in personal items, there, you, you don't get taxed on books. So that, that was the only area I was worried about. Because the truth of the matter is, 
with all the movies and all the music I have, there's nowhere to sell anything here. It's not like I'm bringing uh, things here to sell them. I'm bringing them here to put into a library uh, of my own. But someday, I hope it will go to somewhere else. And I'm thinking about getting an institution to sponsor me. We'll see. But that at least gave me a bit of relief. They said it's possible because these are your personal possessions, blah, blah, blah. And they tend to just look at everything as being a commercial product where my music and, and books and movies are not a commercial product. They're a personal library. And by bringing them here, I am making them worth almost nothing because there are, there are no ways to sell them. People don't even own uh, DVD players or Blu-ray players here. Or, or CD players, or anything like that. They get everything offline. I considered it a bit of a victory when a friend of mine was starting to buy books instead of, you know, read them off some Kindle or, you know, who, you know some sort of tab, whatever. Uh, because uh, I think you have to, you, you know, you have to have the, it's one thing to have, you know, the complete works of Shakespeare sitting on a, on a file, you know, that you can get that off of Amazon or something like that. Because you're not gonna, you're not gonna do it. Uh, looking at the screen is about skimming, not reading, and it's very hard to to really read the way you do a book. A book is just so much better. For one thing, it's not a light source coming at your face. Apart from that, there is another issue, and that is, what about the virus, Fern? Remember that? Remember the pandemic of 2020 and 2021, and early 2022. Well, here's what's interesting about Georgians, and this is very different, I think, than people in a lot of countries. In some countries, you have a lot of people who follow the rules. You know, the Swiss people, the uh, Germans, uh, you know, English people will tend to follow rules. Georgians tend to look around and they're like, you know, no one's getting sick. And more and more outdoors, people were walking around, although there was a mask mandate still. One by one, the Georgians just start dropping it, and the numbers aren't climbing. And the way it seems to work here is, so people are still wearing them in stores and wearing them in the metros and wearing them in places like pharmacies and hospitals and clinics and such. But soon you see, you know, a few people not wearing them on the street. Then after a while you feel stu stupid wearing them, so you stop wearing it. And then after a while, finally then the government comes along after everyone's almost not, <laughs> no one's wearing hardly the mask at all, and say, Okay, mass mandate on the street doesn't is no longer effect, but you still need it indoors. And so that goes on for a while, but then after a while, the people start not wearing them indoors. So then they say, you know, a month or two of this goes on, and then they say, okay, you don't have to do it indoors anymore, except in the metro or the buses, or if you go into a pharmacy, anything to do with health. And now hardly anyone on the metro or buses is wearing them. They haven't given the order to, they haven't rescinded the command to wear them in the metro yet, but that's how it works here. Is everyone starts doing it, and then after a while the government goes, okay, and I'm watching in the pharmacies now, only the workers are wearing them, and the other people coming in are, for the most part, not wearing them. So that's, that's where we are. We're, basically, it feels like it's over. And I've looked at the statistics, I think there was like, you know, one death, you know, I mean, it's, it is done. Which is great, but now there is the cost of what all this means. Uh, there's still all these empty stores. I mean, I was just on the bus looking at, you know, about five, six storefronts in a row, big, huge bookstore clothes that sold just Georgian books. It was the largest of the Biblos chain, a chain of bookstores. Uh, things like that. It's, but at the same time, it really feels like life is coming back. And, you know, I went and saw the Spider-Man No Way Home, and there were quite a few people in the theater. Uh, that was like late last year. Uh, so people are going back. I've been going to friends' events. Um, I have friends in the uh, Georgi Alexidze uh, ballet troupe. And they've had several events, and uh, I've been tagging along to kind of get an idea of who they are. But I also have friends there. Uh, my my other friend uh, Georgi uh, did a uh, has been doing shows at his Tbilisi uh, marionette theater, which reminds me they're doing a uh, a Don Quixote, and uh, I I really want to make sure I'm, I'm not missing that. I need to get in touch with him. 
and I want to, if I can, watch their practice. So, so anyway, and uh, life here now, I I realize how fortunate I am to have snuck in under the wire. You know, like just a couple of months before all hell broke loose with all the people coming here and the prices changing. And I signed a three-year contract, so I'm golden. Um, and, and my neighborhood, as I've explained in other videos, is a great place to live. And, I mean, just so much is here. The only thing that's not right around me is movie theaters or, you know, theaters, ballet, opera, whatever. That's all downtown. But everything else is here within walking distance. And I've been walking. I get up sometimes in the morning at 7 and go walking through Vake Park next to me. I've gotten used to knowing where the dog packs are. <laughs> yes. I, sometimes, I think sometime I'm going to do a, a video on the dog packs. Uh, you, it was cats in my other place. And here there are cats, but there's far more dogs up here near the park. And you can hear them barking. And then people take their dogs for walks there. And some people are a little leery of where they take their dog. But I've loved going up there and looking over at the city in the morning. And uh, I haven't gone out just today. Uh, it was over 30 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, hitting, heading towards 90 uh, degrees. And so it feels very warm out there. But I think I'm getting used to it more. Uh, I'm, I'm not suffering the way I did uh, when I first got here. My first summer was just, it felt so bad. But also, this place is great because it's super thick walls, which keep it cool all day. And I think eventually the walls will warm up and I'll need to turn the air conditioners on. But I've never gone to the uh, first of June before. Like it looks like I'm a day or two away here without turning the heat or air conditioning on in the beginning of like May. Because my other place was right on a tin roof and it was just the window took the full blast of the uh, morning afternoon sun and everything became hot in the house. So, but this is a much better situation. So, that's how things are. Uh, the entire time, we're kind of looking over our shoulder at what's going on north of us. And uh, many Georgians, I've seen this happen more than once. Someone cross, a Georgian cross paths with a Ukrainian flag and make the cross in a gesture of prayer for the country. And the Georgians really do feel a kinship with the Ukrainians because they've both been attacked by Putin. And uh, and I appreciate being here. And it's a very interesting time. I've had some very interesting conversations. Sometimes people who will take, uh, these tend to be Americans, who will take more of the, the Russian side. It's hard to believe. But yeah, uh, you know, and they'll, they'll tend to say, you know, I'm getting too much Ukrainian propaganda, possibly. Uh, but uh, it was funny, a couple days ago, I'm in the Agro Hub uh, grocery store, big store, supermarket, we'll call it, across the way from me. And this guy walks up to me and goes, you look familiar. And I go, eh, okay. I look at him like, oh, have I met you here? And he goes, no, I've seen your videos. And I go like, oh, really? Very cool. His name is Kevin. Probably get together with him uh, sometime later. Uh, and then I ran into these uh, three Belarusians yesterday with another friend. Uh, looked to get together with them. But again, I didn't come here to hang out with expats, but I will, obviously. But uh, I'm here because I love Georgia, and Georgia is a very fascinating country. And it is opening up again for tourism. It is open up again. But make sure you nail down your lodgings before you get here. Make sure that you actually have a place to go because it is rather full. So if you're going to use Airbnb, for instance... If you're not in the city, it's going to be easy. But if you're in the city, if you want to get to where you're going, think several months ahead of time and plan. Don't wait. Do not wait for the last month to plan. You know, get there ahead of time. I'm not going to talk anymore about uh, being a tourist here, but it is open again. You just have to use your smarts, and you might have to pay more money in a hotel or something, which is it would be a little bit more like being in a normal country. But you can still find cheap places. Don't get me wrong. All right. Well, this has just been an update. What's been going on since the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the end. This will be the last of my videos called Infected Georgia because essentially it's over. Yeah, winter will come and more cases. But, 
you know, it'll be more like the flu unless there's a, you know, some sort of omega variant coming down the pike or anything else that people will get too afraid of. But that's something else and we're not going to cover it anymore. So, from Tbilisi, this is Burn saying, Nahuamdis, Drobit, and uh, we shall meet again. <laughs>